morning. Thank you for braving the cold and making it out to worship this morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be with each and every one of you here this morning. Let's call together our hearts and minds, our thoughts and emotions, and worship the Lord our God. Please stand with me as we join together in our call to worship, followed by hymn 521, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The words that are bold and yellow, I invite you to respond with. In the waters of baptism, we are marked as God's beloved ones. What have we done to deserve God's love? God's love is God's free gift to us, always and forever. Even when we are difficult and turn away from God. God's love never vanishes from us. Thanks be to God, who is ever faithful to us. Amen. Rebirth 
in the Holy Spirit. Inspire us in this time of worship that we may claim our own identity as your beloved children. Remind us of that we are your baptized ones so that we may rise to new life and live together in grace. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. People of God, you are known and loved by the Creator. You are marked as God's chosen ones to bring hope and peace to others. Be at peace and live in hope. Thanks be to God. I invite you to turn in place, give your neighbor a greeting, a warm welcome. I'm glad to see you all here this morning. Blessings to you. took place here um, through December, the, all the giving gifts and um, food that we still need to deliver to the pantry, all those kind of good things. And just an extra thank you to everyone who participated in, in just uh, giving the generosity of love and, and showing Christ's face to all the people within our community and on the other side of the world. Um, so, moving on, I know some of you are probably wondering what's going on out there in regards to COVID and, and how that pertains to us. Um, currently, the recommendation from the Wisconsin Council of Churches, which is the broader Council of Churches that oversees not just the UCC, but all the churches, um, mainline churches in Wisconsin, is recommending that, that churches go back to virtual um, services. However, Pastor Franz Rieger, who is our UCC um, Southeastern Association pastor, has recommended that each church does what is best for their congregation. So based on that, um, the consistory hasn't met yet, but Pastor Rich and I have been in conversation about this and feel like at this point, um, being that we do offer a virtual service, uh, we are just going to kind of keep continuing doing what we're doing right now and leave it up to people to do what is most comfortable for each individual. So um, we will continue means or live streaming our services. We're going to continue offering our worship services. However, I, I know I don't need to even say this, but I'm just going to say it, um, that we should be mindful to each individual as far as what's respectful to those people as far as social distancing, masking, and whatever, so that we can continue to offer an inviting, uh, welcoming presence here for anybody who does wish to uh, worship in person, um, that we are able to do that. Um, and for the people who are joining us uh, via live stream or, or checking it out later in the week, that, that they know that we are still offering a safe presence here. Um, but we are going to continue to um, worship together here in community as long as possible. If there would be any modifications to that, um, you can trust us. Uh, don't look to the news for what we're doing. I know that some people saw on the news last night that a lot of churches are closing and had contacted me as to whether we were one of them. Trust me, if, we are, if we're going to make any modifications in regards to services or any of our ministries, such as our, our jam time program, our youth uh, confirmation, shine, sunshine gals, whatever, you will hear directly from us. We will send you an email. For those of you who are um, connected to email, um, feel free to always just call the church or we would, we would contact you one way or another to let you know. But at this point, we're moving forward, um, just trusting that everybody is going to do what's best for them and respectful to um, just the community of people that we are around. All right, so moving on. Uh, follow, oh, and real quick on that note. Um, this just, just goes to say the importance of our live streaming here. And we've just got a couple people right now who have committed to making sure that happens. 
It's not difficult to do. Um, Joe has told me that, Jeannie has told me that. Um, so if it's something that you would be um, interested in doing even just once a month, once every other month, um, I know it would be helpful to just kind of lighten that load for the people who are committed to doing it. Um, it takes place during the first service, but it certainly allows people who are not able to be here in person to connect with us via um, YouTube. So please consider if that is something that you would be interested in helping us out with. Um, talk to Joe after church um, or message us during the week, and we'd be certainly happy to set up a time when she can show you what needs to be done. Alrighty, then uh, today we are going to be taking down Christmas decorations, so immediately following this service, I know Mary is spearheading um, cleanup as far as decorations out in the Friendship Hall or Friendship Room and whatnot, and then um, taking down the tree after the second service, so anybody who's interested in helping or able to help with that, we would appreciate it. Um, and then we are asking for continued prayers for Sue Calhoun and Jessica Frederick as they are um, dealing with their health concerns. And then we'd also like to offer our um, sympathy to the family of Monique Perkins, who um, she lost her aunt this past week, so we would like to extend our sympathy to them. Uh, flowers on the altar today are from June Sommerfeld in memory of her mother-in-law, Fanny Sommerfeld, so we thank her for the flowers. Uh, we are grateful for Larry Wheelock, who is joining us again at the organ today and offering our Ministry of Music. And then birthdays today, we have Terry Milligan, and throughout the course of the week, um, actually um, next Saturday, on Owen Block's birthday, or on Owen Block's wedding, Tamla will be having a birthday, as well as Sophie will all be celebrating weddings and birthdays that day, and Susan Kiss also has a, a birthday on the 15th, so we're going to wish you all a happy birthday today, so join me in singing. Happy birthday to you. All right, and then I'd like to invite John up to offer our first scripture reading. The first reading this morning is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba, in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight, and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made the word of God.
use your music as do. I want to invite you to stand with me if you're able for our gospel reading this first Sunday of Epiphany. It is the account of Jesus' baptism from the Gospel of Luke. Every gospel has something to say about Jesus' baptism, and this is Luke's account. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John the Baptist, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The word of the Lord. He was in the process of writing a book on the Gospels, and sadly that book never got written. 
But that class changed me more than the dozens and dozens of other classes I took because there's one phrase that I took from it and it forever changed the way I read the Gospels. And it was this idea that the Gospels are not pictures. They're not meant to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John writing history per se. It is instead these Gospel writers giving us an impression, a portrait of the one that they have walked with, talked with, met, that saw crucified and saw resurrected. That they are in some way not trying to give like a snapshot picture. They are instead painting a portrait. And a portrait is always kind of a way that that person impresses you. I believe this is Vincent Van Gogh. And you can see a picture of him on your right. On the left, you get his self-portrait. And obviously, there's not details there like there are in the picture. It's, it's not meant to be so literal. Instead, he's trying to paint an impression of who he is to convey who he is to himself. And that's what portraits are. We're trying to capture the essence of a person. And that's what the gospel writers are doing. They are writing to capture the impression that Jesus has given upon them. And they're painting a portrait of Jesus that is unique to their experience. And because of that, sometimes they don't tell the same story. Sometimes their stories can even clash a bit. It's interesting, Matthew sees Jesus as the new Moses. That's why in Matthew we have five extended discourses. Five of these two to three chapter lengthy discussions. One of those is the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is giving the law. Five discourses like the Pentateuch, like the books of the law, because for Matthew, Jesus is the new Moses, the new lawgiver. He is the one that is the fulfillment of all the scriptures. That's much different from Mark's gospel, where Mark just comes out of the gate without speaking of the birth, doesn't have many extended discourses, because for Mark, the main portrait he wants to paint is Jesus as the suffering servant, surrounded by bumbling disciples. Luke wants to tell the birth stories because Luke is very interested in showing that Jesus is not connected to Israel, but Jesus is connected to Adam. And that's why his genealogy takes us all the way back to Adam, because Jesus is the new Adam, who's come for all the world, particularly the broken and the outsiders. And then, of course, John just hits the ground running with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So what's interesting is all four are telling different stories, their impressions of Jesus to them. Only two, Matthew and Luke, have birth accounts, and it's for specific reasons. Matthew wants to connect Jesus' birth to the Davidic dynasty, to David's lineage, to the people of Israel, to the fulfillment of Scripture. Luke wants to connect Jesus' birth to humanity, that Jesus is the new Adam, embracing all people. All are painting a different portrait, and they're all different. And that's why it's especially important to notice when events happen in all four Gospels. Again, remember, the birth only happens in two, but when an event happens in all four Gospels, that means that event is incredibly significant. Now, when you read all four Gospels, they all share the last week of Jesus' life, and they all want to talk about everything from the triumphal entry a week before he's crucified, through the betrayal, the arrest, the crucifixion, and resurrection. But there's only four events that all four cover, other than the final week. Two of those we're covering this morning. John the Baptist preaching. At Jesus' baptism. They all four want to cover that. They also want to cover Jesus' rejection in Nazareth, which we look at in two weeks, and the feeding of the 5,000. When all the Gospels want to focus on one event, you realize how significant it is. And that's why I want to press upon you this morning that we spent weeks celebrating Jesus' birth. But for the Gospel writers, Jesus' baptism is far more significant. Only 50% cover the birth. 100% cover the baptism. So what's so significant about this baptism? Why is this so important to all four gospel writers? All four want to talk about this man, John the Baptist, who comes with a message which you can see in his scroll in this icon, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist who comes, and I use this picture every time we talk about John, because look at that head of hair. Yeah, you can trust this guy. Yeah, instantly, you know, he's trustworthy. He's got a beautiful uh, head of hair. And he comes with this unique message after hundreds of years of prophetic silence. No prophet has spoken. 
But all of a sudden in the wilderness, a prophet comes upon the scene. And that prophet not only says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but he then says, here's what you need to do to prepare for the one who is coming. You need to be baptized. And this baptism is unique in history. Because there's nothing in the Jewish economy, the Jewish way of doing things, that would ever demand that people get baptized like this. So that scholars wrestle with, what's John doing? What kind of baptism in this is this? And the best answer is this is proselyte baptism. John is inviting Israelites to do the same thing that a Gentile convert to Judaism would do. And that is to wash themselves of all their impurities so that they can prepare for being the people of God. So he's saying to the people of God, you really need to wash things up. You need to be ready for a new start. You need to go through even Gentile baptism because you've got such impurities. There is something new coming and we all need to be ready in this new and wondrous way. His ministry is so powerful. It leaves such an impression on the people that you heard in the gospel reading this morning that the people begin to question, John, are you the Messiah? Because you seem to be such a powerful personality. But John goes out of his way again and again to say, I'm only preparing you for something else. I baptize with water, but there's one coming of whom I'm not worthy. And what he's doing will be so much more than what you're getting with me, this, this water baptism. And the proof that this coming one is coming with a new and more exciting and more powerful baptism is on full display in Jesus' baptism. Because Luke uses a phrase that you don't use lightly. Luke says the heavens were opened, which is a way of saying that thin veil between heaven and earth is removed. And all of a sudden, heaven intersects with earth. The heavens are opened and a dove. And it's interesting the way this phrase is used. The Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form. So tangibly, something's happening that people can see. And yet it's still a transcendent experience because it's only like a dove. It's not really a dove. So in bodily form, like a dove, this imagery descends upon Jesus. And it can reflect a number of different things from the Old Testament. It can reflect the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the waters in the creation account. It can reflect the dove that comes to Noah after the flood is over and we're about to begin a new creation and a new movement. And so there's this hope that something brand new, a fresh start, is about to occur. This wonderfully transcendent experience occurs. And in the midst of this transcendent experience, the words of God are heard directly. And Jesus is given an experience that will forever shape Everything he does, everything from this point out, will be driven by an awareness of what he's being told right now by the Father. The Father says to Christ, you are my son. This is your identity. You are the king. You are the Messiah. And you are beloved. This deep cherishing that the Father has for the Son. You are deeply beloved. This is the relationship we have. You are dearly cherished. And this assurance that I really am pleased with you. I think well of you. And long before we get that creedal language of Trinity, that God is one being uh, in three persons, that the love of God is interpersonal, that there's this deep love affair between Father, Son, and Spirit, we see it in its primary form here, that the love between the Father and Son is communicated through the Holy Spirit given to the Son, and through that same Spirit, the Son Response to the Father. We get this deep sense of relationality, this deep sense of love. And it's at this point that after 30 years of being anonymous, Jesus' public ministry begins. And it's mentioned in all four Gospels. Because baptism matters. Everything Jesus does will be influenced by his awareness of who he is and whose he is. So that he knows that he is the Son. In the very following account of the temptation, the evil one will say, if you are the Son of God, to cast that into doubt, because that's the identity that's going to carry him. Everything from this point forward will come from this deep sense of being deeply loved by the Father. Everything will move from this deep sense that Jesus is well-pleasing to the Father, that Jesus is deeply cherished and loved. So that throughout the wilderness experience and the temptation and the rejections he experiences and even the cross, the event that will carry him all through his life is his baptism. 
just as it's meant to carry us. This is why baptism matters. Baptism is meant to impart to us that same cherished identity, an identity that goes unchanged throughout our lives, no matter what events and experiences and losses and tragedies and difficulties we encounter. It's this identity that we go back to again and again. We are the child of God. We are the beloved. God is pleased. God looks down upon us with pleasure, not with anger. It is that identity, that relationship, that's meant to carry us through all of our challenges and all of our trials. I don't know how many of you get the UCC Daily Devotional. Today, the woman that wrote it wrote about this very thing that Martin Luther, the original reformer back in the 1500s, when he would go through times of doubt and despair, and he went through a lot of them, he would remind himself of one thing. He wouldn't say to himself, I have faith, because, you know, faith is walking. Uh, sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's not. He wouldn't say to himself, I've done good things. Instead, when he needed to remind himself to move forward with boldness and courage, he would say to himself, I am baptized. I am a baptized one. I am a child of God, the beloved. God takes pleasure in me, and I must move forward no matter what the darkness, no matter what the doubt, no matter what the despair. Existentially, when we feel insignificant, when either others say to us or we say to ourselves in that self-deprecating voice we all have, you're worthless, you're a failure, uh, you are a nobody, you're unlovable. We're meant to be reminded, but wait, I'm a baptized one. I'm beloved. I'm the child of God. I am pleasing to God. God looks upon me with pleasure. That is supposed to be the deepest identity that we carry throughout our lives with us so that it sticks with us throughout the many different identities we have. Because you all know we have numerous identities as we move throughout life. We start off life with the identity as a child, as a son or a daughter. And then we move into the identity of a student, and we're either a good student or a bad student. And then we move into the identity, while being a student sometimes, of being an athlete or a musician or a band nerd uh, or a dropout. We, we have different identities based on our achievements or lack thereof. Then some of us, we move into the identity of spouse. Or we take on a job and we move into the identity of our vocation, of being a worker, identified by the job we have, by the achievements that we do. Some of us, we move into the identity of parent. And all of a sudden, we move from child to parent, and we realize our identity is constantly shifting, constantly changing. And then, if we're privileged to live long enough, we move into the identity of retiree. And we've got to be, deal with this whole new shift in our identity, identities we've worked hard to establish and try so desperately to maintain, and yet no matter how hard we try to hold on to all of these identities, they all slip away over time. Because our achievements change, our age changes, our relationships change. There are significant times when everything we know about ourselves drastically changes. There's a book by Gail Sheehy called Life Stages that talks about how there are different times in our life where it's like an earthquake happens underneath us because the identity shift is so, so drastic. Like when we lose our parent. And all of a sudden, what does it mean to be a child at that point? Or we lose our spouse. What, what does it mean to be a widower? What does it mean to be a divorcee? We lose our job. What does it mean to be someone who's not identified by the vocational label that I had before? Or children leave home. And all of a sudden we have an empty nest. And what does it mean to not be the parent in residence? To not have people under my charge? Or we hit retirement? Or we start to lose our health? All those different things slip and slide all over the place so that our identity is constantly shifting and changing and is lost over time. And thus we're always forced at some point in our lives to ask ourselves, who am I when I no longer am who I used to be? Who am I when I'm no longer the moneymaker? Who am I when I'm no longer the boss? Who am I when I'm no longer the teacher or the student? Who am I when I'm no longer the spouse or the parent in residence? What does it mean to be alive when I no longer all of these identities that were so important and valuable to me? Who am I when there's none of these things left, nothing left to hold on to when I stand before God and before myself with empty hands 
And the answer to that is quite simple. And it's so hard to remember. I'm a baptized one. That's who I am. That's who I've always been. That, that doesn't change no matter what my other identities are. When all is gone and everything shifts, I still remain a child of God, beloved, pleasing to God, because a child never changes to its parent. It forever remains a child. And when those moments happen, during these deep earthquakes and shifts in our identities, how wonderful it is to have some stable place to go to and to say, you know, this is who I am. At the end of the day, I am a baptized one. And it's for this reason that baptism is important for what Jesus' life experienced, but it's important for ours as well, because all through our lives, we're to remember our baptism. Now, for most of us, baptism is one of those things that feels like a one-and-done event. Um, we have this happen all the time at church. You know, kind of one-and-done, you get baptized, you never see the person again. It's just, you know, got it out of the way, you move on. But baptism really is meant to be something that's not just one-and-done, but that establishes forever who you are so that you constantly go back to it and say, oh yes, this is who I am. Because over time, with all those changes of identity, we forget. Barbara Shaw was my only quote this morning. She says, inevitably, life has a way of bringing us out. And we forget that God dwells in and among us. We forget our beloved identity. We experience spiritual amnesia. Baptism is what counters our amnesia. The touch of water upon our lives helps us recall our place in the biblical story and reminds us that God's creative force is still birthing us, claiming us, renewing us. In other words, and I used this phrase about 10 years ago, we are to walk wet. We are to constantly go back and remember our foundational identity, the only identity that doesn't shift and change and slide away from us. Now, we're in the Protestant church. The Roman Catholics have a wonderful way to constantly remember this. If you have a Catholic background or you've attended a Catholic service, you know, in the back of the sanctuary as you're coming in, there's a font. And as you enter in, you're to dip your fingers in the water, make the sign of the cross because you remember your baptism. You enter into worship because you are a baptized one and you're constantly remembering and rehearsing that I'm a baptized one. Now, rituals can tend to lose their meaning. That's the challenge with rituals, but that doesn't mean rituals should be given up. Uh, just because the an anniversary you cherish every year with your beloved might not have the impact that your honeymoon did, doesn't mean you stop saying, well, I, you know, anniversaries don't do it like they used to. No, they bring you back. They bring you back to the point where you remember what this was all about in the first place. So we don't have a baptismal font, and I'm sure that I'd experience mass resistance if I were to say we would do that, because Protestants are deeply scared of doing anything that seems too Roman Catholic, although we pray prayers just like they do, people, and speak to Jesus just like they do. We're deeply afraid to, so we're not going to do that, most likely, but there are other ways you can walk with. Every day, or maybe every week, depends on who you are, you take a shower. <laughs> Hopefully every other day, every three days. I don't know. You take care of your own energy. Um, but regularly, we are either submerged in a tub or, for most of us, I imagine, showered upon. What a great time to remember. I walk wet. I'm supposed to remember that I'm a baptized one. This is who I am. I am forever held in the divine grace because of an identity that I didn't work for, that I didn't gain, that I didn't merit, but that was given to me by the grace of God through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. And if showers aren't the thing for you, next time it rains. The beautiful thing about rain is it's available to all. It doesn't just rain down on the baptized, but it hits Saul. And to remember, you know, not everybody is aware of God's deep love and, and grace and acceptance, but I am aware of it, and that walking wet hopefully will remind you for a moment. When you go swimming, you can submerge yourself and pretend you're a Baptist for a bit. Just completely go underwater. We've died to sin, we rise to new life, instead of just being sprinkled in the covenant. Or, in spring, summer, fall, when you look out in the morning dew and you see that the entire landscape is covered with water, to let that be a moment that reminds you, I am a baptized one. You could do that right now. It's not quite as fun with the snow. You know, that's just frozen water. The, the, the whole earth is covered with this water. Walking wet is a challenge for us because we forget. 
We forget our baptism when we're called to remember it and renew our sense of being baptized once on a regular basis. About 10 years ago, I preached a sermon that used the phrase walk wet, and I think just immediately after, the India team went on one of your mission trips to India, and uh, they actually, you know, uh, earlier this week I said, Jen, how long has it been since I've used the phrase walk wet? And she, you know, do you remember it at all? She said, oh yeah, I remember it, and here's why. Because 10 years ago, when the India team went to India, if anyone had a bad attitude or was misbehaving, uh, is that kind of right? Maybe not misbehaving, bad attitude. Just a reminder. So there was nobody who just had to go. <laughs> okay. You had a spritzer bottle, right? And the spritzer bottle was to remind them daily that what they were doing in service to the Lord on behalf of the man of UCC to people that the Lord loves dearly was an expression of their baptismal identity. That it was coming out of their need to express the same love to them that had been shown to them in God through Christ in their baptismal identity. They were reminding themselves to walk wet. I think that at the end of the day, you could say that the reason all four Gospels want the baptism of Jesus to be at the beginning of his public ministry is that everything he does flows out of that. Every act of service, every act of kindness, every dealing with challenge, wrestling with betrayal, even moving to the cross, it is all strengthened and charged by the fact that Jesus knows he is the Son. He is beloved. He is well-pleasing to God. And out of that sense of identity and relationship and assurance, he's able to carry himself forward in a way that honors God. And it's meant to do the same for us, that we're to walk wet, to remember that we are baptized ones, the beloved, with the deepest mark possible, an identity that never shifts or changes, with this deepest truth that we know who we are and we know whose we are. And there's no deeper truth. Identities will change over time. We'll move from child to parent to spouse to empty nester to retirement if we're fortunate enough. All of our identities shifting and sliding. But the one identity that carries us all our days is we are the baptized ones. And we walk well. Well, we're going to follow this with a renewal of our baptism together here this morning. But before we do, I want to give you just a few moments to reflect upon uh, a word, a phrase, a thought, something that might have challenged you, inspired you, encouraged you, something that might spur you on to greater acts of love and service. Just a moment of reflection before we renew our baptism and vows together. So I have before us a baptismal renewal liturgy. It has some responsive parts that are gold and yellow that I'd like you to respond with. But essentially, this is just renewing our baptismal uh, vows and identity. Sisters and brothers in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, God's Spirit has been poured out upon water, water poured over and immersing us, water that flows freely for all who will receive it. Water from the streams of God's saving power and justice. Water that brings hope to all who thirst for righteousness. Water that refreshes life, nurtures growth, and offers new birth. Today we come to the waters to renew our commitments in each other's presence. To Christ who has raised us, the Spirit who has birthed us, and the Creator who is making all things new. Let us then unite with the church in all times and places in confessing our faith in the triune God. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now this gets more personal because we all took personal vows in our confirmation and in our baptism. Our parents took these same vows and now we make them ourselves. I ask you now in the presence of God in this congregation, do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and the world? I renounce them. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you, by the grace of God, promise to be Christ's disciple, to follow in Christ's way to show love, to practice justice, to resist evil, and to witness to the living Christ? I promise, with the help of God, do you promise to devote yourself to the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayer, to celebrate Christ's presence and to further Christ's mission in the world? I promise, with the help of God, O oh God, your word of light and hope floods into our lives. We have lived in darkness and despair and fear, doubt and strife. But on this day of celebration, you remind us that we are marked by you to be witnesses to your light of new hope. As the heavens opened at Jesus' baptism, so is your love poured out upon us. So we bring before you names and situations which concern us, people who face illness and grief, whose lives are torn apart by poverty, war, alienation, addiction, and hopelessness. We think particularly of Sue Calhoun and Jessica Frederick, praying that your hand would be with both of them. We pray for Monique and her family with the loss of their aunt. We pray for Gary Barber or Doug Stewart and all those in our community experiencing doubt, difficulties, challenges, hurts, pains. May we all know your flourishing, the life that you bring into being through your Holy Spirit. We ask for your loving mercy on all these people, O oh Lord, for them, for us, and for our world. We pray boldly as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to stand if you're ready for our final hymn, number 577, O Love That Will Not Let You Go.
fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now and forevermore. Amen.